All right, we're here again with Bill Tackett. Bill, let's just get straight to it here. Opening arguments today, the biggest takeaway, we finally heard from the defense, and they're claiming that Elledge had a part here in killing G. What's your takeaway? It's really important to understand that an opening statement is not evidence, and, and you've got to know that right off the bat, because it's, it's a time for both sides to give a roadmap as to what they're going to present. And it's, you know, the prosecuting attorney always goes first and always gives an opening statement. And they kind of lay out like uh, Danny Knight did today, what, what's going to take place and what evidence there is. Now, he was up there for a long time because he has a circumstantial case. It means you've got to make a patchwork of all these different pieces of evidence and bring them together, all right? The defense does not have to give an opening statement, and usually they don't. They want to see how the state progresses with their case, and then they'll decide what they're going to do, whether they're going to give an opening statement after the state's case. In this case, there was a chess move, all right? The defense said, we're going to give one. Not only are we going to give one, we're going to tell you what the story is, and we're going to tell you that it's coming from the defendant, okay? Very unusual. Now, back to my statement about opening statement not being evidence, all right? If the defense wanted to, and this is where the chess move comes in, if they wanted to, they could get to the end of the state's case, say they didn't prove it, we're not putting our guy on. So you bring that up, the other big development there, right, from defense attorney Scott Rosenblum, that they will put Elledge, at least they say they do in the opening statement, that they'll put Elledge on the stand to testify. Can you explain to our viewers why that's surprising? It's surprising because now you're saying he killed her, all right? Now we gotta know whether it's accidental or not. So it shifts the whole paradigm of the trial, right? It's a strategic move. Plus, he's got that story out there in front of the jury now. If he pulls back and doesn't put him on the stand, they now have the defense theory in front of them. And if they match that up against what they hear from the prosecution and buy it, then it drops down and you get into involuntary manslaughter. And now being a former prosecutor, go back into those shoes, your prosecuting attorney, Dan Knight here, you hear that, what goes into your thought process after? Well, first, you're, you're surprised. But secondly, you're going to prepare a cross-examination, which in this case, with all of the tapes and all of the, the evidence, it would be very difficult for him to survive very well in a cross-examination. That's why I'm not sure he's actually going to take the stand, all right? Because I, 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 I think that Dan Knight would spend several hours, uh, if not an entire day, cross-examining him over all the different aspects of this, all the different circumstantial pieces that I was talking about that creates the fabric of the case. It would be a shot at the defendant that could make the defendant seem guilty of either premeditated or second-degree murder. You were in the courtroom earlier today. I know they played those audio tapes. Did you hear them? Were you able to listen to them? Yeah, they were difficult to hear. I didn't have the earphones, right? I think it might have been clearer. Um, I understand there are transcripts of those, but the, the theme of it, what you could hear uh, was the state of mind, and that's what uh, Dan Knight was trying to get across to the jury. And there's nine hours of this. It's a long time, but it's, it's, a, it's a thread that goes throughout about his, the defendant's state of mind, which is critical to saying, okay, he then made this next step, and here's how, this is how we're gonna prove that. Is it fair in your opinion to now say the trial shifts from no longer did he kill her, but now did he intend to kill her? Is that fair to say? Yes, it is, and, and it's, uh, again, it's a shift. It's, it's not I didn't kill her, it's I killed her, but let's see how I killed her. Did I do it? Uh, as, a, as a mistake or an accident, right, go to sleep and then wake up and she is uh, deceased and then I go into uh, some kind of a state of mind where I don't know what I'm doing and I put her in the car and I drive her around for three days until I finally dump the body. I mean, that's, that's a stretch for sure, but it would be more of a stretch if you had to defend that against a seasoned prosecutor during cross-examination. Tough tough uphill battle. Bill, you've been following this case just about as long as we have. We've talked about it several times. Can you just explain how surprised you were by what happened in court today? Well, it, 
nothing, it, it's a chess game, and you have to understand that if you're a prosecutor or a defense lawyer and people are moving pieces around and you're aware of that. Even while someone's testifying, there are shifts that occur and changes in testimony and things you didn't expect. So you kind of come to expect it. It's pretty rare, though, that a defense lawyer in a case like this um, gives an opening statement without seeing what the state, how the state's evidence actually rolls out. And then to commit a story and that your guy's gonna take the stand and tell it because it's too soon, all right? That decision is normally made at the end of the state's case. You say, okay, should we put him on or not? But here they've come out and said, we're gonna put our guy on. This is the story he's gonna tell you, which is why I'm not convinced that's actually gonna happen. Okay, Bill Tackett with some great analysis. Bill, thanks so much.